and welcome to this week's preview show. BBC Radio Solent's Chris Temple is back alongside me as we look ahead to another weekend in the Premier League. Here's what's coming up today. We'll be looking back at last weekend's 1-1 draw against Sheffield United here at Vitality Stadium and we'll then be going on to look at tomorrow's game against Aston Villa at Villa Park. But first we're going to start back at last weekend and that 1-1 draw with Sheffield United. Chris Meppham got the goal but here are the short highlights. Ryan Fraser's right-footed ball is deep, and in comes Billing, nods it down, Ake with an overhead, and turns Callum Wilson, Mepham! The most unlikely scorer of Bournemouth's first goal of the Premier League season is Chris Mepham! The centre-half from close range, it bounced around twice, and Mepham was there to drive it home, and after 62 minutes, the Cherries take the lead. Well, we had three goals in it. As you said, the ball was bouncing around. Keeper made a couple of saves. It was Meppin. Well, I don't think he hit it cleanly, but who cares? It hit the back of the net. That's the main thing. Well, Ake had a go. Callum Wilson had a go, saved by the keeper. And then Meppin drove it into the ground. And it may have been that slightly uh, unclean connection from Meppin, which actually helped it go in as it bounced over the goalkeeper who was already on the ground. So David McGoldrick going off and... Oli McBurney coming on, the Sheffield United change that was already planned before that goal went in. Don't, don't underestimate Billing on the far post who headed the ball back. Magnificent header. Absolutely. Two and a half minutes left. It's down the right side of the box where Bulldog will drive it in. Right across the six-yard box, beaten away. Billy Sharp equalises. Sheffield United do have their goal. The Cherries were not switched on. They may have got fortune at the other end. When they scored their goal, the fortune went United's way this time. It bounced a couple of times off defenders, and the former Southampton man, Billy Sharp, poached it home with two minutes left. Bournemouth won, Sheffield United won. Well, again, Rico was involved, wasn't he? It slipped down the side of him. I'm not sure. He's in, he's, two people are in the wall, and he's one of them. But you also have to cover the slider ball down the side of you. Well, that was last weekend, our season opener against Sheffield United. Chris, it was a, an interesting game, wasn't it? 1-1 one, one and, and one that the Cherries might have looked to, to get more out of. Yeah, with two minutes to go, you thought they were going to win it. Uh, probably unjustly, actually. I thought Sheffield United did enough to get a draw. Um, I think the, the worrying thing from Bournemouth's point of view is the front three um, just didn't fire at all. They, I mean, Callum Wilson was hardly in the game. Joshua King you know, had a, a, one, a couple of those runs, but then it came to nothing. Ryan Fraser didn't really get an opportunity to get in the game that much. So I think when you've come off a good pre-season, and obviously bouncing off that result against Leon here, 3-0 when the attacking sort of thrust looks positive and they scored a few goals in, in pre-season. Both Callum and Joshua King have been on target in pre-season and Ryan Fraser as well. Um, so I think that was the disappointment, was the, the lack of sort of, um, I guess, coherence between the front three and thrust as well. Now I know that it was a, a new formation and Sheffield United were, you know, sat back quite rigidly for a lot of the game until Bournemouth scored um, but I think that the biggest sort of concern out of it of course apart from the way the goal was conceded which is goes without saying um, I think that was the biggest worry really that the, the front three just didn't look themselves um, and in a home game you know against newly promoted opposition uh, you've got to look to that to have your, your big players and all three are internationals um, to, to be at it from the word go and it's sort of strange how you can be looking good in pre-season and a week later when it actually matters um, you're like oh hang on a second we're a bit rusty so yeah that for me that was a sort of the thing to take out of it was was a sort of lack of uh, sharpness I guess up front. And one thing that may have frustrated fans a little is you know not making a substitution to the, the 89th minute Dominic Slanky coming on and you know not giving much time to impact the game despite again a good pre-season for him. Yeah uh, substitutions I know have been a bone of contention for, for a while and some people feel that Eddie should you know roll the dice a little bit quicker. Um, sometimes he has a sort of formula where he'll he'll drag people at half time if it's not working. Often the hour mark is quite a, a sort of a notable time for him to make a couple of changes if it's not going well. Uh, maybe when he was starting to think about making changes they scored of course you know in that period in the second half so it might have been that things were starting to happen in the background that we will never know about um, and the goal change matters um, and then you know once you're 1-0 up do, do you necessarily need to need to change it Sheffield United didn't carry a lot of threat until their subs came on uh, McBurney came on and obviously you know started to busy himself a little bit Billy Sharp obviously scored the goal um, 
I should mention about the goal, by the way. I've seen a lot of talk on social media and forums and things about VAR and whether um, that goal should have been disallowed under the new rules where if it hits a hand and there's a, it creates a chance from which a goal is scored, it should be chalked off. Now, I've spoken to Eddie Howe about this. They've looked at it from every angle, slow motion, and they're happy that it was the right decision that a goal was given. So that should hopefully just clear that one up from their point of view, because I'm sure they would have found a way to, to say that they got VAR'd, but they were they were happy that was a goal. And when you look at the game across the whole 90 minutes, you know, one really good chance in the first half, which fell to Chris Metham, and then the chance in the second half again fell to Chris Metham. He had an interesting afternoon, didn't he, Chris Metham? Because after 30 seconds, the ball sails over his head, catching the wind, and, you know, suddenly David McGoldrick's through. Thankfully, Aaron Ramsdale got him out of a hole there. Um, you're right, just behind us here, he, he sort of snatched at the shot. He felt like he should have scored that uh, and then he was the sort of unlikely poacher when a bit of pinball around the box and let's face it both goals were messy both goals had you know very sort of similar characteristics to them but yeah great for him a great day for him to, to score your, your first Premier League goal he'll never forget it um, I tweeted a stat out after the game that Chris Meppham has scored two goals in his career one for Brentford one for Bournemouth both in 1-1 home draws against Sheffield United which is just ridiculously random um, but yeah for him defensively is that the key part of his game goals are a bonus um, and obviously defensively you know himself, Nathan Ake and a, a not fully fit Steve Cook um, will take a bit of time again I think to, to gel when they play in that three. Talking of the defence just behind them we had Aaron Ramsdale, Aaron Ramsdale in goal and he chose to go with him what did you make of his performance? I thought he did really well yeah I mean as Mark Travers you know Mark Travers had more to do um, in, in the game down here against Spurs uh, but I thought Ramsdale did absolutely everything that you could have asked of him he kicked well uh, he, he, the one thing I've noticed about him he has a real confidence um, I've seen that from him you know you'll have seen it as well around the camp he, he's got a, a real character um, he's, he's not a sort of a wallflower let's put it that way um, and maybe he's you know maybe he's done a little bit of maturing over the last couple of years maybe the loan spells you know, have, have sort of, I guess, got his mind focused a little bit as well. But he made a couple of great saves, um, a good a good punch this end as well, where he came out and cleaned a few people out. So I think, you know, thrown in as a 21-year-old on your Premier League debut. And of course, the nice fairy tale against his old club, against the manager who gave him his debut. So there were some nice sort of romantic lines with it as well. And I think probably my favourite line after the game from him was that he was really looking forward to going to watch his old teammates AFC Wimbledon in the Carabao Cup on Tuesday because he made a real connection with them and he went on to say now is my time to make a connection with Bournemouth and, and the fans because now is my chance on the pitch on a Saturday to show what I can do and hopefully the fans will come to, to like him here as much as other clubs have. And another player we saw last week Philip Billing made his Premier League debut for Bournemouth and, and he, did, he did well didn't he? I thought he did well I thought he looked good in there for a guy who hasn't played a lot of football only been training with Huddersfield's under 19s over pre-season Season. Alongside Jefferson Lerma, there's going to be some thunderous tackles going in in that midfield. The only thing I'll say on, on that sort of pairing is uh, it, it, there's a robust nature about it. There's a sort of a, a dynamic physical nature about it. Is there enough creativity in that pair? That's what's going to be under the microscope over the next couple of uh, games, I think, to see, you know, fair enough, in a, in a job, in a two, they'll, they'll protect the back four very well. We saw Billing have an absolute thunderbolt of a shot, which when you saw the side-on angle for that, it was like it had come out of cannon. Um, great it's save. A brilliant the save. And the it? keeper yeah. somehow diving to his left ended up injuring his right calf. So that's how that's how it sort of sent shot waves through his body. Um, but yeah, so that's the key. Lewis Cook obviously is coming back from America this weekend with Simon Francis. So he's going to be back in training. So he's only going to be, I think, three or four weeks away probably. So he obviously provides the creativity. Um, but Billing and Lerma will be in there for now. Um, and I like what I saw from, from Billing first up. And a slight blow before the weekend was Dan Juma. He, uh, he picked up an injury in training. We're not sure the extent of it just yet, but that was a little bit of a blow. Yeah, I don't, he won't be available this weekend. Um, so yeah, when you sign someone for, what was it, 13, 14 million pounds, you and he plays in pre-season, then he doesn't make the first game of the season that's obviously disappointing so he remains sort of a I guess a bit of a ghost figure in the background that we won't know what we're going to get from him until we see him in a, a Premier League game um, exciting uh, exciting talent for sure bit of a connection with him because a couple of Villa summer signings are ex-Bruges players as well like he is um, so yeah at the moment the, the jury will remain firmly out on him until we uh, get to see him hopefully soon Absolutely. Well, next up, our attention turns to the game against Aston Villa tomorrow at Villa Park. Let's take a look at what happened last time we played the Villains. Bournemouth haven't committed too many forward. Richie. Now Francis. Stoppage time at the end of the first half. Bournemouth in front. Villa guilty of switching off. Well, that was Lax. 
Clark has been caught out, and Villa have been punished again. It sums up their season. Josh King gets born the second. Well, goals from Steve Cook and Joshua King there. Chris, we'll be hoping for a, a more of the same tomorrow, won't we? Yeah, I mean, Villa fans, we're going to encounter Villa fans in a different mindset to then because that was the result that pretty much sent them down back at the, uh, the end of the 2016 season. But it's a, it's, a, it's a passionate, vociferous place to go. People say every stadium is, but some are definitely more than others. And Villa Park, that whole 10, when it gets going, it's an absolutely massive stand. But that was a, you know, an encouraging performance, catching Villa at a bad time um, then for sure. The Villa that Bournemouth are going to face this weekend, you know, completely different, riding the crest of a wave. Um, but Steve Cook and Joshua King, I'm sure they'd both like to open their goal scoring accounts away at Villa again tomorrow. And speaking of, you know, Villa Park, it is a, a bit of a fortress to go. And first home game of the season, it'll be absolutely rocking, won't it? Yeah, Bournemouth fans will remember back, you know, 2015 when Villa came down here and uh, upset the Premier League party. First ever Premier League game, Villa were the visitors and won 1-0 here, possibly slightly against the run of play as well. So I suppose Thierry's owed them one from that point of view to go up there and to, uh, to spoil their big Premier League homecoming. They've sold 30,000 season tickets there and they've got 8,000 people on the waiting list, which just tells you the, the magnitude of the club. They've spent £140 million over the summer on 12 signings. Now, money doesn't buy you success. That's one of the old cliches. Fulham spent loads of money last year. They've, they've gone down. Um, but they seem to have recruited quite strategically of course quite a lot of the money's in the bank account just behind us here for for Tyrone Mings um, which I'm sure Thierry's will be looking forward to coming up against and hopefully getting one over him but yeah Dean Smith and a bit like Chris Wilder last weekend for Sheffield United a bit of a romantic fairy tale um, supported the club as a boy used to sweep the Holt end when his dad was a steward um, you know a local lad and again who, another one like Chris Wilder who's earned his stripes in the, the lower leagues as manager of Walsall and Brentford and here he is getting his, his Premier League chance and we should mention Richard O'Kelly of course former Cherry's assistant as well who was assistant when Eddie was a player here back in the Sean Driscoll days so another one who's you know great for him to get a Premier League chance so yeah it's, there's, there's a nice story with Villa but I think the money they've spent they're billionaire co-owners now who've bought the club outright they've just bought Villa Park as well for 53 54 million pounds they look to be having a right crack and what did you make of Villa's performance last week? They were up, up against Spurs, a, a tough team, and for 70, 80 minutes, things were going very well, weren't they? Yeah, if you look at the shot count after the game, I mean, I think it was 31-7 in Spurs' favour. Um, the game didn't pan out like that. It took Spurs an hour to get going. You know, Villa will have stunned that stadium. John McGinn scoring early on. Um, John McGinn is Ryan Fraser's roommate on Scotland duty, by the way. They have quite a lot of banter on social media, if you've ever seen that. So that'll be a contest to look out for tomorrow in uh, sort of midfield or the wide areas. But yeah, I mean, Villa, what a tough opening game that is to go to Spurs but to go 1-0 up you know game plan for half the game was going brilliantly Spurs threw on Christian Eriksen obviously who we've seen against Bournemouth can can often change the game so in the end Spurs had, had too much power for them but that's the life of teams outside the big six is that if the big six are on their day it's going to be very difficult so yeah Villa fans will have enjoyed it for an hour I'm, I'm pretty sure and will have been encouraged by the way their team played Tyra Mings I think had 17 clearances more than anybody else in the Premier League last weekend so he was certainly a busy boy uh, and he's become very much a fan favourite there. Well, you mentioned Tyrone Mings it's it's a shame he didn't really ever get the chance here you know with his injuries to, to show what he could do but he seems to you know have, have settled in well at Villa. Yeah last week there was a bit more room between or there's a bit more room this week because we had Willow between us here and he was a huge fan he is a huge fan of Tyrone Mings and thought he could be something quite special um, you know eight million pounds best part of eight million was was quite a lot for a player of his experience when he signed here as a left back um, converted to centre back Injuries, you know, he's just had such bad luck with injuries. When he came in, you know, he mixed bag of performances. He, you know, he might make a mistake or two. Um, but when you're coming in, you need you do need that time to gel with your defensive partners. He never really got more. I don't know exactly what the stat is of how many games he played in a row, but I'd be amazed if it was any more than six or seven in a row. Um, so for Bournemouth, that is. So yeah, going to Villa last year, I think it was the sort of resurgence, new lease of life he needed, became a cult hero there. His performances there obviously enabled Bournemouth to bump the price up a little bit. Uh, I think it was an initial 20 million or 21 million and then a few extra bonuses and things. He's even been talked of in England circles already. So I hope for him he can stay fit and do brilliantly. I hope he has doesn't have a great game this weekend because I want Bournemouth to win. But um, yeah, what a play I think he, he could have been and still could be 
it's a shame that Bournemouth won't, uh, I guess, see that in a red and black shirt. And speaking of the, the Villa squad in general, we've talked about Tyron Mings, you mentioned John McGinn, but who are the ones to look out for? Because, of course, as you say, they've spent an awful lot of money. Well, Wesley up top is uh, one of their, their new signings, who, again, is a little bit of an unknown quantity in terms of English football. So he'll be sort of leading the line. He played up front on his own last weekend, which, again, for an introduction to Premier League football will have been will have been a tough one. Uh, Trezeguet wide on the right, um, Mahmoud Hassan, but known as Trezeguet, simply because apparently he looked and played like David Trezeguet when he was in one of his youth teams, age nine. That's why he's called Trezeguet, not because it's his actual name, um, but it's his official name on his shirt. Um, and obviously, you know, Tom Heaton in goal was a great late signing for them as well, eight million pounds. So what a, you know, a lot of people linked Tom Heaton to Bournemouth actually as well before, you know, when the, the goalkeeping merry-go-round was a bit more uncertain. Bjorn Engels, heart of the defence, has, has already formed a very good partnership with Tyrone Mings. They didn't lose in pre-season Villa, so they've had quite, they won every single game, scored a bag load of goals. Um, so they, they seem to have gelled pretty early on. Uh, the one I'm interested to see is, is Douglas from Manchester City, the Brazilian midfielder who never played for City, um, hasn't played first team football for a, a couple of years, but has just got his work permit through. Um, pretty sure he was on the bench last weekend. Uh, and he's a, a City player. They don't let many good ones go, City. £15 million, pounds, um, he could be, and again, he could look a bargain by, uh, by halfway through the season. And of course, in terms of our team news, we said earlier, no Dan Juma, but apart from that, there's no fresh concerns for Eddie Howe to worry about. No, uh, still, I mean, as we, we're going to say every week, but Steve Cook is, didn't look fit last weekend. He, he did say he started to struggle after about an hour um, of that game last weekend. His groin has been playing him up, um, so he's going to be managing himself. I think I said that last weekend. Um, but other fitness worries, uh, you know, Dan Juma was the only blow, really, on, the, on match day that he wasn't going to be available. Um, the other ones, Lewis Cook, Simon Francis are in America, coming back Sunday, Monday. Um, Francis is a bit further behind. Junior Stanislas is still a little bit away. Lloyd Kelly still a few weeks, maybe four or five weeks. Seems a long list, doesn't it? It does get, list. yeah. And Dan Gosling we've got to mention as well, who's a good still two or three months away. I spoke to him uh, this morning as well. He showed me his scar, which is very nice of him. I didn't really want to see it just after breakfast, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so there's, there's a few around. And you, David Brooks, of course. Um, you think of when all those are back fit. But you know, ultimately, last weekend, the, the team had a, a, a decent enough look about it. But obviously was rusty and, and you know was nowhere near the levels uh, and people will talk about the 3-4-3 formation and whether that suits Bournemouth I, I don't know and um, Harry Wilson I, I would think would would get a go this weekend definitely and as per last weekend I am going to ask you for a score prediction <laughs> <laughs> what did I say last weekend I'm sure you I'm said bang three, on, you I? didn't know you no, said three one to Bournemouth last week see Willow last week said two nil he always says one one he said two nil last week and it was one one so he should stick to his guns uh, I would I, mean, I think Bournemouth would take a draw right now I think Villa are going to be decent at home this season um I don't think the attacking three can be as blunt again as they were last week. So I'm going to say they're going to click and it's going to be 2-2. Because the last three away games last season produced 19 goals. 5-0 at Brighton, 3-3 at Saints, 5-3 at Palace. I know the pressure was off by then. Eddie loved that stat, didn't he, in his he, press conference? He, he loved me throwing that at him, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go 2-2. 2-2. Well, there we go. If you are over 18 and you want to take part in predicting the score, then you can head to mansionbet.com. This week's winner can win two hospitality tickets to our game against Manchester City, with the overall winner of the season winning a training ground experience. That's all we've got time for for now, but if you are going to Villa Park, have a safe journey. If not, make sure you keep an eye on all of our social media for the latest updates. Bye for now.